everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first in-person, for us anyway, book discussion. It's really exciting for me to be up here to be able to chat with Mary in person about this one. This is our final discussion for 2022, and we're closing out the year with Leslie Vetter's The Bone Spindle, a retelling of Sleeping Beauty. And Mary's going to go ahead. I should introduce us. I'm Elizabeth Wilcox, and this is Mary W. Jensen. And Mary's going to go ahead and lead with our book discussion questions. Um, she's very well prepared and has notes, so I defer. <laughs> All right. So in what ways is the retelling similar to the original? And I know you just barely read a lot of the original versions yesterday. Um, there's a lot of good similarities. It seems like the Bone Spindle is a fairly straightforward in a lot of ways retelling not just adaptation of a Sleeping Beauty story. Briar Rose is beautiful and is sleeping. Pricked a finger on a spindle at the 16 age. Cursed because a fairy slash powerful magical person was angry at birth for some reason. Um, slept a hundred years. And I do appreciate that the full hundred years is there because that's something that always bothered me about the Disney version. She barely slept at all. What kind of curse is that? Meaningless. Um, I can't argue too much with that because um, my own retelling, she doesn't sleep that long, <laughs> but the curse doesn't say she'll sleep that long either. Right? Yeah. It's a different Type of thing. It's a different <laughs> vibe, too. There's more stakes in your retelling. I feel like it's a minor inconvenience. Like, the 16 years of hiding in the forest was so much worse than the 30 minutes of that, being asleep true. in a castle. <laughs> Which is different. Um, but, yeah, there's a, a lot of similarities. Someone comes along and saves, wakes up via a kiss. The briars that surround the castle, the people in the castle being cursed to sleep along with the cursed uh, princess in the original. Obviously prince in this one. Um, but still royal youth. Yeah. Either way. Uh, am I missing some significant similarities? No, that that's pretty much what I had in my notes. You know, the 16th birthday activating the curse and... And there, there is the the secondary spell casting that happens. Like the curse happens, and then another figure says, After "Wait, the sleep here's my gift to, to turn it from death to sleep." Thing. That's true. That's yeah. I've yeah. The original curse may be different, but yeah. the sleep part is the same. Tempers idea. it, and yeah. that's there too. Like the, and in this case, obviously witches instead of fairies, but powerful magical figures. Either way, yep. Yeah. Leads us into how are the two stories different? This is where it gets exciting. And a lot of times you might be tempted to think in retellings that are meant for maybe older ages than you think that fairy tales are for, that the retelling or adaptation might be darker. But actually a young adult adaptation of the original Sleeping Beauty is significantly less dark than the original tale, which is not not the the f kind of comparatively fluffy Disney story that kids grew up with. I also thought it was interesting that the Grim Tale, who was usually known for being, you know, darker, is of those three. You had what Peralt, and... Peralt, and the the older one from the Persa Forest, um, Basile. I hope Bastille, Bastille, yeah. Yeah, Jean-Baptiste de Basile. The grim one is actually the least disturbing of the three and fairly which tame. Is which is wild. Unusual. Yeah, that's very unusual. A whole different comparison there. But for this story, mm -hmm. uh, well, obviously a big thing is that it is gender swapped. Yeah. We don't have a princess that needs to be rescued. It's a prince. Yeah, which is a much appreciated difference that adds... Uh, a whole different flavor. It's not the usual damsel in distress story that we're probably a little tired of, especially if we happen to be damsels. Um, the 
the change Vetter makes that allows for Briar Rose to communicate with his rescuer and get to know her ahead of time is also a, a deviation that is much appreciated because it lends the possibility for consent to that kiss that wakes up the sleeping beauty. Yeah. Uh, and that is sorely missing in the original tales. And some of the original tales don't end at a kiss. So even more disturbing than you think. Yeah. Genuinely strong consent problems in the original stories. I would call it rape. Because oh, it is. And when, when she doesn't even wake up until her babies are born. And yeah. suffering on her finger. Right? Oh, but then... Why is she happy and delighted? And then and he realized the king was actually even still married to right? someone else. It was, oh, it's horrifying. It's... <laughs> it has very strong, in that way, the, the darker Sleeping Beauty tales that do have the not doesn't wake up till she's woken up by the baby she's given birth to. It's horrifying. Uh those are a lot more reminiscent, I think, of kind of Greek and Roman mythology. It reminds me of, like, the women who are visited, raped by Zeus. You know, that kind of... I think there is a, even a tale of someone being, like, impregnated by Zeus when he turns into sunshine or rain or something. And is surprised yeah. and awoken by birth, giving birth. And that's just not okay, but also... Much more traditional than what we see Leslie Vetter do. Thank goodness she does not treat us to either a rape or a pregnancy or waking up via giving birth. None of that happens. But yes, even with the communication and having a chance to form a relationship, even the kiss is consensual. Yes, which is, which is really refreshing. And the kind of change I hope to see. Unless they're pointing out the problems with the lack of consent, which is a great possibility yeah. to do. Just choosing to change it so that it, there is consent is a really nice difference. Uh, we already kind of mentioned, too, instead of kind of fairy figures or distant, powerful women who are a little bit more removed from things, the it's the powerful witches of Briar Rose's kingdom, one of whom actually is his sister, mm -hmm. who are directly involved. The one who is the evil witch character, the spindle witch, is, or is it the bone witch? The spindle witch? I want to say the spindle witch. Spindle witch. Yeah. She is a little bit more removed. She's treated as like the most ancient and removed from things of all of them still. But there's a lot more, uh, kind of humanization of the magical figures than is there in the traditional tales. Very true. So one thing I did like to, um, in all the other tales, our Briar Rose character is an only child. That's very true. Briar Rose here has two older siblings. And often it is... Um, like a much long awaited for child, like a special mm -hmm. child. And I do like that in this one, instead, two older siblings, and he is set apart for this curse, not because he's the most favorite child or the only one, but because he happened to be sickly and to need some magical help to fix his health problems. Mm -hmm. Which is depressing, but, you know, relatable, <laughs> I guess. I, couldn't we all use a little bit of magical help to feel better? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not at the cost of our mother's lives, but... But you can also see why a, a mother might be willing to make bargains to exactly. save a child. Yeah, a very Nothing. fairy tale thing to do mm -hmm. as well. So even though it's not there in the original tale, it feels very fairy tale that Vetter went with that. So another thing that was kind of similar, but not exactly with, as we established, there is a hedge mm -hmm. around, you know, the, the briar hedge around the castle and all the other stories, the prince comes and it's the faded prince and 
the thorns magically part, turn to flowers, till they go in and you know, it closes behind them. So it's only them that can get through. Mm -hmm. But it does part for them. And this one, those thorns aren't going anywhere. But there was still another way, a path provided. That's true. So it's it's kind of the chosen one who's meant to save the royal. It's not parting magically. They don't, aren't hacking through. But through knowledge, they're knowing the mm -hmm. secret path through, which is nice. It, it gives a lot more agency and a lot more room to like appreciate the actions and knowledge like maybe the reason they're the chosen one is because she actually has the the knowledge and know how to make her way through this rather than just that mystical fatedness or yeah. prior betrothal in some cases looking at you again disney same yeah, I did love that that was such a, a part of the main character, Fees, that she was that historian channel, the knowledge of the magic and the realm. And yeah, I love that uh, Vetter acknowledged that you probably, for this kind of an adventure, do need a little bit of a swashbuckly, strong, slashy something. Mm -hmm. But instead of that being the only thing needed and it being like the chosen person to save this prince is just a warrior. She's like, no, actually she can hold her own when need be, but she is just knows things. She's a historian. She's studied this and she's smart enough and lucky enough to have a warrior friend who's coming along to do mm -hmm. that part with her uh the inclusion of the character of shane is another really big difference because there's no companion true. character in any of the original tales that helps the prince and in this case shane is helping fee the whole way and it's a really good element of a friendship story and a a balancing of each other's capabilities partnership kind of a situation yeah that was great yeah any other main differences you wanted to point out or you want to move on? Uh, I guess one big difference is it feels a lot less resolved when the resolution happens. And part of that is because Vetter is setting us up for the sequel. Um, but it's more of a, hey, your problems aren't solved by the Briar Rose waking up. His waking up is just the beginning of your next trial and your next adventure because the enemy responsible for this curse didn't just disappear and wasn't defeated through the process of waking up Briar Rose. So that's, that is the difference. I feel that's like true. the, the wicked fairy figure just kind of poofs away and is like, eh, I placed my curse. I'm not going to think about it anymore. And doesn't actively interfere again in a, in is it in any of the traditional tales? Yeah, even those, it's not the witch that like provides the spindle. It's just some old lady it who doesn't know any better or something. Happens to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Like the I get the sense in the original tales that the witch isn't vested in this. She's like, hey, you know what? Fuck you. You didn't invite me. You didn't treat me well. You're gonna die. Actually, your kid's going to die. Like, you just deserve it. Bye. <laughs> Casts the spell, forgets about it, leaves. She's too big and important to be bothered by any follow-up. She doesn't even bother to follow That's up and be true. like, how dare you change <laughs> my curse to only be <laughs> sleeping? She's just like, you know what? I caused a hassle to everybody. I'm done. But in a lot of the retellings, even the Disney retelling, it's a lot more personal. There's a lot more intervention. Mm -hmm. Like malevolent in Disney follows through and is like, I'm going to turn into a dragon to stop this from happening. I'm yeah. going to get myself killed. That's just not there in the original tales, but it is here. So I guess in a way it's kind of the, the active intervention and the vestedness that the wicked fairy, or in this case, witch has is a difference that kind of makes it more similar to other retellings rather than to the original tale. Right. 
So did the retelling retain enough of the original to be satisfying? I think so. I think it very much felt like, despite all of the differences and the ad- additions, this is Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, we had a spindle, a sleeping spell, woken with a kiss. You, you've just got all those all main of elements. the classic elements that Without first all the spring to mind. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, the the things that if you just go to a casual person on the street who doesn't study fairy tales like we do, and we're like, "Is this Sleeping Beauty?" They'd be like, "Oh no, yeah, it hit the it hit the main points." So, what did you feel the retelling did better than the original? kind of touched on. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is what we mentioned about consent. Um and then the usual thing that kind of expanded retellings, at least the good ones tend to do better, which is to flesh out the world and make it feel believable. I think the original tale does not in any way really address the void of power that happens when a whole ruling castle of a kingdom goes to sleep for a hundred years and how that might affect neighboring kingdoms and politics. Uh, And this Vedder does a really great job of that being a core basis for what's happening in the region and makes it feel like a very vibrant world. So I'm actually going to jump forward a little bit because Mm -hmm. that's really my main point for what gaps did the retelling fill that we're missing in the original. Good point, yeah. I felt, yeah, really how the world is affected when a whole kingdom falls asleep for a hundred years. The land was affected. We had this small little group of witch hunters became this big faction. You know, magic is now something to be feared and no longer welcomed. And it really did change and show how that happened other than, oh, her dress looks like the one my grandmother wore. Yeah. <laughs> The the original tale just really doesn't deal with that in a way that allows for a really easy suspension of disbelief. And Vetter, I just loved all of the details of it's not so long ago that we have no idea what this kingdom was like, but this kingdom has become dangerous enough and different enough. We have border patrols, we have guards, we have reasons to be careful of it and i like that that allowed for this treasure hunting aspect um one of the things that happened in the bone spindle is that if you have ever played any ttrpg or other kind of role-playing game where you're dungeon delving or you're you know going on adventures as a party to get treasure it's got all of those vibes like Shane and Fee are uh, themselves that dungeon delving duo of a party um, making their checks for, do I detect traps and do I disable this trap? Mm-hmm. And what well, was my reflex save? <laughs> uh, and I could see someone very easily setting an entire TTRPG in the world that are built here because it feels like that's what it's built for. And that's a lot of fun if you're a fan of that kind of thing, which I am. So I had a lot of fun. Uh, I, sh- I should have written it here, but I loved that initial quote with, with the rules that they came up with. Like, you get all the knowledgey stuff and she gets the expensive treasures. Yeah. And nobody touches the magical artifact. But what happens? You touch a the magical, magical artifact. artifact. <laughs> now look, we have to do a quest. It's like, but those were great rules. Great rules. Yeah. To. What a healthy way to divide treasure. I know you want books and knowledge. Mm-hmm. Take it. I want treasure. <laughs> I'll take that. Beautiful partnership. Yeah. Great synergy. And I did appreciate the synergy between Fee and Shane in general. I thought that... Their clashes were really realistic, but also their reasons for sticking together and appreciating each other were likewise very relatable and made sense as an aside. (laughs) As well, we're at that point. Are there any other points that you want to bring up or discuss? Uh, I would say uh, I do. I, I have one minor criticism. But I don't know if it really should be a criticism. So I will see what you think about this. I 
for the life of me could not wait to find out what this curse was. The butterfly curse that Fee had. I was like, why can't she just go to her parents' home? Why is she so hesitant to ask anyone for help or advice? What is going on? And I still think that maybe she uh, is very foolish for not asking for advice or being open about what happened to her. And she's harming her parents by just acting like she's avoiding them instead of saying, dear mom and dad, I am cursed and do not want to hurt you. Especially when we have established correspondence that's reliable. Just send them a letter, yeah. Fee. What are you doing? You're hurting everyone. But I do think I would have appreciated a less slow rolled reveal of what the curse was. Because it would have helped me judge her less harshly. Because I could not. Un I was just like, are you just really egotistical and you don't want to admit to your parents that they were right about your bad boyfriend right. or something because that's different from yeah. I don't want my parents house to burn down because I visited for too long so that's uh that's a kind of I would have liked I'm glad the reveal happened but I would have More liked that, that reveal much earlier in the book I think that's valid and then we, we could still have had the how it came to be more later. But exactly. Was, but like knowing yeah. if I sit still too long. Like there was hints at, because of what it's called. But at some point I was just like, girl, do you even know if you're cursed? Or do you just have a mysterious tattoo? Like yeah. tell me why I should empathize with you better. So I did love um, so some of the references to the Disney tale. Mm-hmm. There was an Aurora. She was the original Rose Witch. That was a fun Easter a egg Easter in there, Aurora. yeah. And then at the Masquerade Ball, dancing with the Baron, who nobody else could see. And it was essentially like dancing with a set of clothes. Yes. And I had just immediately had that image of dancing with the woodland animals using Which the red Which was very much what cloak. that was. Like, oh my gosh. That was a brilliant moment, yeah. Um, I really loved that. Uh, I loved that Vetter worked in in a lot of her characters that were original characters that weren't in Sleeping Beauty necessarily. Still had very fairy tale themes. Mm -hmm. um, the curse, like the bad boyfriend who curses someone because he wants her to end up with him, feels very fairy tale. Yeah. Also very relatable to people who've been through some bad manipulative relationships in general. Uh, Red is very obviously a little red riding hood combined with the actual wolf from that story kind of mm -hmm. figure. It gives all those vibes. Uh, even Shane feels like she has her own fairy tale with her background and how she left her position as the heir in her own, uh, I don't know if kingdom's the right word. Sure. I, I'm not sure what her sort own of home yeah. she was heir to the throne and chose to leave that and i think that that was fun that it felt like everyone had their own fairy tale story mm -hmm. to tell and we're just kind of focusing for this book on the briar yeah. rose story but that doesn't mean we're not seeing all of these other elements that are fun i'm pretty sure in a couple points shane was also um called the huntsman Mm -hmm. which, you know, combined with Red and Red Riding Hood and gave them their own little... Right, like Red and the Huntsman who might save Red from the wolf, who mm -hmm. might also be an aspect of Red. I look forward to seeing how, that, how that plays that out in the next right. book, too. And the next book comes out next year, right? Very That's soon, so. like next month even. Early next year, I think. So that's exciting. Uh I do wish there was a little bit more of a resolved feeling in the first book, but I do appreciate that we at least got to the point of Briar Rose being awake and yeah. out, and then it ended. So it, did so it covered that, that arc. story arc. Um, Even if I'm, just, I'm just not patient or good at <laughs> rating, so I was like, I just need book two immediately. Please. So Maybe next year we can... Um Check further to see if these are going to be first books <laughs> because we had a lot what, three of out of first our first out of the series. Yeah, that this was quite the year, and they were all accidental. We didn't, yeah. 
we hadn't looked realized. So we'll we'll they try for next books. year to have more good, standalone yeah. ones. Um, just because we might all need a break from being on tender hooks waiting for the next book. Mm-hmm. At least they were all good enough. We really wanted the next book, though. I yeah, will I say. think we had a good batch this yeah. year. Um, I do have my usual critique that I'm finding with almost all of these retellings I have. I wish that all of the characters were aged up a little bit. I do appreciate that Briar Rose didn't have a lot of life experiences to make him seem far too mature for Fee because he technically could have with his, you know, astral projection, basically a hundred years more of experience, but he's still very much a teenager who's just been not gaining knowledge and experience that would set him maturity wise past fee by a hundred years. So that's good. Yeah. And even before the actually falling yeah, asleep, it was very he cloistered was life. He didn't have castle. Yeah. Yeah. But I do wish that all of these figures weren't still teenagers. It has because been very traditional to do that. Setting it up old. for these first romances or in Fee's case, I guess second, but like these, teenage romances to be like the be all end all for an entire lifetime and i still just think that that's not the the healthiest thing for teenage readers of these ya fantasies to really imbibe too much of and that's kind of the big thing that's out there in almost all ya books whether they're romance or just have romance in them it's all like this is the love of my life who I met when I was 16, 17. And that's just not necessarily healthy to think is the way it is. I don't want a bunch of teenagers to be like my high school partner is going to be my partner for my whole life Mm -hmm. or I've done something wrong. Like, no, you might not meet the, the partner for your whole life for another decade or more. Calm down. Um, yeah. But I do understand it because they are very young figures in the fairy tales often. Uh, but I think it's something that could afford to be changed. And we're changing other things. Let's just yeah. go ahead and, and update change that, that, too. that trope. Yeah. yeah. So I don't necessarily hold it against Vetter like she was going to be the one to change the whole trope. But I do think it's a trope that needs to change. Any other things about the book that... We haven't mentioned. No, no, just the shock of re- rereading, you know, those early tales and <laughs> the one thing that didn't come up. Two of them, we had the prince's mother or stepmother figure wanting to eat the children of the new, the baby. Why? And, uh, <laughs> it's like, like, okay, one case, she's the spited, because it was actually... The, the king's wife, and it was the king that woke up the princess. And you know, the king uh, definitely uh, committed some adultery if that's the result of waking there. that. Yeah. But, but then also, the other one was just a prince, but he had an ogre for mom. mom and, and she just wants to eat babies, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, those are just like, the original tales. If, if any of you watching this <laughs> have not read. Like the Jean Baptiste Basile and the um, Perot versions of Sleeping Beauty, and you are only familiar with Grimm or Disney, please read the other versions at least once. They are wild. Just so you can react. <laughs> and they give you a great idea of what a lot of these original tales they were dark, they were weird, they had did not mm. hold anything back. Um can you imagine a retelling or an adaptation that actually used those elements? Like, like it would be the very story dark. ends before that. Okay. Right? Yeah. Princess is woken up, married happily ever after, not... Not married. <laughs> Someone tries to eat her babies yeah. happily ever after. Like, it's... Yeah. Yeah. But overall, I really enjoyed the book. Mm-hmm. Looking forward to the sequel. And- yeah. I think all of the ones we've had this year I've co- that have a sequel have come out and been like, you know, I'm actively interested in and eager for the sequel, which is really nice. It's not my favorite thing necessarily just because 
I've had a lifetime of waiting for sequels and being like, please come out now. And I'm not very good at delayed gratification, I guess. I want it now, now, now. <laughs> um, but that does mean they're really good books because yeah. I do want to find out what happens to these characters. I and I do kind of want someone to write a whole TTRPG campaign <laughs> set in the world Vetter has built for the Bone Spindle. Um, Shows the strength of the world building. It there. really does. Uh, and I think if you enjoy fairy tales, absolutely read this. If you're looking for something queer friendly that is definitely. a fairy tale retelling, definitely read this. And if you really enjoy the kind of vibes of a TTRPG world, but you just want like to read it in a book, like Legends and Lattes did, with it, but in yes. a lot more cozy than an adventure way. This is another book to put alongside of that. Yep. It's a great fun adventure mm-hmm. plus romance mm-hmm. plus fairy tale. Yeah. Was- it did a lot of things and it did them well. I felt yeah. like it was very well balanced. I agree. It was so exciting to be actually do this in person. In for person. Us. For real. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to do it again. Um, who knows? But hopefully... <laughs> And uh, in the meantime, we will see you all virtually and each other virtually in January. Not in January. We'll have Um, the new book picks announced in January. And then we'll be doing another discussion in in March March for the first quarter pick for 2023. So look forward to that. And thank you for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful, happy new year and lots of great book reading to come.